Okay, folks, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Marketing with White Papers and Other Free Content. My name is Craig Stouffer with Pinpoint, and I'm joined today by our special guest presenter, well-known internet strategist, Bob Lai. Today's webinar is going to focus on how do I create great content to generate leads. We do have a special offer for our qualified attendees today that we'll mention here. The first is for Bob. We have four free marketing reports. You can go uh, to www.bly.com slash reports. There's over $100 worth of reports that you can directly download for free. For Pinpoint, if any folks want to try Pinpoint to drive traffic to their, their offers and so forth with our email marketing platform, we're offering a free month of service, anywhere up to a $500 value. You can go to our website link there, get started, and use the coupon code PPTWEBNR for a limited time, and that'll give you free access for a month. Okay, just a 20-second background on Pinpoint so you know who we are and why we're here today. Pinpoint is business class email marketing. Uh, people have described us, our customers have described us as a constant contact on steroids. Uh, we have about 6,000 companies that are using the Pinpoint platform, mostly mid-sized businesses, both business to business or to B2B, as well as business to consumer or B2C. It's a great platform to use to promote your content with Pinpoint. Okay, and with that, let me tell you a little bit more about Bob. Uh, Bob is a well-known internet strategist, copywriter, and my opinion, excellent teacher. We've done several webinars. I think this is our fifth or sixth webinar together, and uh, we get great response from it, great feedback, and, uh, and quite, a few, quite a bit of pass along too, so, so this is really great. Um, Bob is a prolific author, over 75 books. He's appeared on TV and radio, and he has clients ranging from IBM to AT&T, and he's helped many customers with their email marketing, direct marketing, and copywriting. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Bob. Thanks, Craig. It says, the true measure of your education is not what you know, but how you share what you know with others. So your company may be the subject matter experts on heat transfer fluids or whatever it is you do, but unless you share it with others, no one knows you are the expert, and therefore they're not uh, more favorably inclined to, to buy from you or to work with you rather than your competitors. In other words, it's not enough to know more. You have to let others know that you know more. George Bernard Shaw had a great quote. He said, if I had an apple and you have an apple and we exchange apples, then you and I will still have one apple. But if you have an idea and I have an idea and we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. Well, if you consider uh, yourself as fishing for prospects, the prospect is a fish, as in this diagram, and you're the marketer, you've got a fish hook to catch him. The bait piece is the worm. The free content offer is the incentive for the fish to bite on the hook. So the role of the bait piece in the sales cycle, shown on page eight, is you send out your promotion. But within your promotion, you offer the free white paper or free content. And to save time, let me just use a uh, free white paper to mean any, uh, any kind of free content. So we offer in our promotion a free white paper. Instead of just talking about our product or our service, we say you also get, if you respond, this valuable white paper. When you make that offer, the prospect can either request the white paper or turn down the offer. If they turn down the offer, they go back on our list and we continue to market to them. If they say yes, if they want the, the white paper, you have to fulfill the request don't offer free information and then forget about it. You actually have to send what they ask for. Then you follow up, as you would in any sales cycle, and some people will purchase after the follow-up. Others don't buy right away, and then you put them in the queue for ongoing continued follow-up. And that's how a bait piece works. And later we'll look at how much adding the offer of a white paper can increase response to your marketing. Do white papers work? Surveys and research uniformly show that they do. Uh, in one survey, 89% of IT professionals said that content had an impact on their preference of technology vendors. 69% of, of prospects who like your white paper, paper sorry, will pass it on to colleagues. And 57% of IT professionals said white papers influence their purchase decisions. Also, they like white papers better than other marketing content, such as web pages or brochures or, or sales sheets. 
what are the benefits of offering white papers? There are six of them. Number one, a white paper sets the specs. If you write a white paper called 10 Tips for Selecting a Motionless Mixer, then the reader will follow your steps and look for a mixer that uh, meets those requirements. And of course, you wrote the white paper so that your mixer fits all those requirements. Number two, it makes the prospect slightly beholden to you. It doesn't, they don't feel that they have to buy your product because you gave them white paper, but they did feel you gave them something free. And so on the principle of reciprocity, if you give someone something valuable, they feel they have to give you something valuable in return. What they do is give you some of their time and attention to your, to your marketing pitch because you gave them this valuable white paper. Number three, offering a white paper or any kind of a bait piece generates more inquiries. As I said, up to 100% more. Number four, publishing a white paper on a topic establishes you as the expert on that topic. So if your white paper is ma managing Unix data centers, the publication of that positions you or your company as experts in managing Unix data centers. Number five, it helps educate the market. It makes the market think about the problem that you fix, the way you think about it. So you, are, you and them are on the same page. And number seven, as we saw on the previous slide, with that, where we saw that 57% um, of IT professionals said white papers influence their buying decisions, that white papers actually can drive sales, number six, point number six. What's interesting is if you look at on slide 11, uh, a table I compiled of today's top gurus, well-known experts in, in any field. And for example, in commercial real estate, that would be Donald Trump. In conservative politics, uh, Rush Limbaugh would be, a, would be my choice there. In entertaining or hostessing, I guess hostessing, hosting, what's politically correct, Martha Stewart would be the guru, the expert there. Uh, in permission marketing, it would be Seth Godin, personal advice and landers. And if you look at this table, what you'll notice is every one of these people has written and published at least one book. So the way you get known as an expert is to publish, disseminate information. And uh, a white paper is, in, in a way, a short book. Or if you write 10 white papers and put them together, you have a book. So it's, very sim it's a very similar idea. On slide 12, first thing you have to do is when you're putting together a white paper, is to choose a topic. And there are many variations available. As we talked about, you can do a selection guide, how to 10 tips to selecting the right mixer for your process, a how-to publication, how to do something, how to win friends and influence people. You can do uh, something that is a result of a survey that you have taken. Use SurveyMonkey to take a survey and then publish the results in a white paper. Case study that focuses on one application of your technology or your product. Methodology that's devoted to your method of solving a problem. Implementation guide, not what the solution is, but how to, how to install it or uh, integrate it with your existing system. Controversy, a topic that people uh, uh, debate over. In the direct marketing field, it might be, should the post office be kept open or should it be closed? The US post office, of course. Consumer awareness guide, that's a way of teaching people about a particular product category. Uh, one fellow who was very successful with this approach, Joe Polish, published a consumer awareness guide to carpet cleaning services. And he was a carpet cleaner. Application on a specific application of a product. And then ROI benefit, showing the buyer how to calculate the return on investment they get from purchase of the product. Now, you don't have to necessarily call it a white paper. And on slide 13, we show some of the different names by which it's called. And the, the names mean, make a difference. Uh, they have, they have a, 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 a terminology that connotes value in different ways. For example, if you're going to a, targeting a senior management uh, audience, you can call it an executive briefing, and it sounds exclusive. If you're going to engineers or users and it's instructional, Call it a manual. That has a high value-added sound to it. If it's how to choose or specify a product, it's a consumer awareness guide. 
a buyer's guide or a selection guide, product selection guide. If it gives information, tips, technical data, advice, special report can be used. If it's quick tips, maybe on one side of a sheet of paper or two sides of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, some of, sometimes it's called a tip sheet if there's short numbered tips. If it's technical in nature or it's research data, such as in the medical field, it's called a monograph. If you print it as a physical, uh, not, not electronic, but a physical document and saddle stitch it, put staples through the spine of it, it's known as a booklet. And if it's a folded piece of paper that's not stapled, but just a piece of paper folded to form four or six or eight panels, then we call it a pamphlet. One question that comes up on page 14 is how to title your, what are the options for titling a white paper? And there are a few basic options. One is to use a list title. Example, the top seven security problems of 802.11 wireless networks. I like titles that begin with the active verb ing. We talked about this one before, managing large Unix data centers. Why is a good word for a title. Six Sigma doesn't work as an OK title, but why Six Sigma doesn't work is more curiosity arousing. A colon means you can have a, a, uh, a dramatic title followed by a subtitle that plainly explain, explains what the paper is about. Defending the remote office. Sounds sexy, but what does that mean exactly? It means which virtual private network technology is best. And of course, how to is a category of white paper we discussed earlier. How to prevent machine parts from failing prematurely is something people in a machine shop would want to read. Here's an example on slide 15 of a white paper. This was on uh, password security and something called enterprise single sign-on where people could get onto all their systems with a single password. And the title of the paper, which was controversial and based actually on a quote from Bill Gates, who predicted the end of passwords was the death of passwords. When planning your content, well, what do I mean by planning your content? Most organizations of any size don't have just one white paper. They have multiple content pieces and usually going to multiple audiences. So if we look at this uh, table, you see that what you call the content matrix. We see that the horizontal line is the, the title of the recipient, the CEO, the CFO, the end user, and the technical or the IT person. The vertical axis is the purpose uh, of the content piece or where it fits into the sales cycle. Does it generate leads, fulfill inquiries, answer a request for a proposal, try to close the sale? And now we look at this table and we say, well, where, where would each uh, of our uh, pieces, our content pieces that we're producing fit on this table. So one type is a cost-benefit ROI analysis to show how soon an investment in this product category pays its own cost. For example, I was once writing for a firm that made content management systems, and one of their sales problems was not that people weren't interested in content management. They were, but they had the perception that it was expensive and that it, would, it was a nice idea, but it would never uh, pay for itself because they, they cost so much. So we did a content benefit ROI white paper to show the cost savings and how quickly a, buying their co the content management system would pay back its cost. So that would we aimed at the uh, financial officer because it had to do with money, and we sent this uh, paper uh, when fulfilling inquiries. After someone had made an inquiry, we sent them this white paper. So you see that star in the appropriate space on the matrix. Another type of white paper might be the problem solution. We have, uh, you have this problem, our product is the solution. That here it was aimed at a technical audience and it was uh, given to people who had requested a quote. And then another type as we talked about is selection tips, how to buy product X. And that you can use a uh, offer as a lead generation piece and in here it was offered to the end users. How do you get started in this? Let's look at slide 17. Uh, one easy way to get started in content management is to create a basic document. It's 
people often call this the basis document. That's the basis of all your other content. And so to do this real simply, you, you use this form on slide 17, and it says 10 tips for blank. So blank is the problem you want to solve. 10 tips for managing Unix data centers more cost effectively. And then underneath, you list all the ideas that you can think of. And it doesn't have to be 10. It could be 7. It could be 12. All the ideas you can think of that would help you manage a Unix data center uh, more economically. And then you write up, uh, you list them on the, on the spaces. And then underneath, you write a paragraph or two expanding on it a little more. And then you've developed a document that could serve as, an, as a preliminary white paper, a little tip sheet, maybe two sides of an 8.5 by 11 page. Another format for creating this document that makes it even easier on page 18 is to make it a question and answer format. In other words, uh, here, seven questions about managing Unix data centers economically, dot, 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 and one good answer to each. So you put the questions the prospect is likely to have. You know, what, what software tools should I use to manage my Unix data centers? What kind of reporting is available? Uh, what's the major cost factor in running a Unix data center? Whatever the questions were, you put them under Q, and then under A, you write a one or two paragraph quick answer to that. And that also can be published as its own document, just edited to clean it up, uh, polish the language, and publish it as, a, as an FAQ sort of document. And that has value as a bait piece or as free content. What's the white paper writing process? It's shown on page 19. And if you follow the flow chart, we start off with source material. Every topic on which you're going to write a white paper, or virtually every topic, there's already a, a lot of information available within the organization that you can collect and use as, as source material. So we collect that, and, and we see that in the upper left corner, source material. That material is given to the writer or the editor. It may be a, an engineer a scientist, a product manager, or a professional uh, content writer. The writer and the editor, we'll just call them the writer. The writer then come, reviews the source materials and comes up with a list of questions. You see that below. Then moving to the left, they ask the subject matter experts the questions, and the subject matter expert provides the answers to the writer and the editor. Now, armed with the source materials and the answers to her questions, the writer produces a draft. The draft then goes to technical experts, the subject matter experts, for review. If it's not OK, it goes back to the writer for a rewrite. Once it's OK, it goes on to management. And they look at it, and either they approve it, approve it or not. If it's not, it goes back for a rewrite. If it's approved, it then goes on to the design phase which we'll talk about in a minute, and then the reproduction. If it's uh, paper, it's going to be printed. If it's electronic, it'll be posted somewhere, made into an HTML page or a PDF. How do you, we, we said, uh, or I made the statement, and I'm on page 20 now, I made the statement that materials uh, for, on, on the topic for, on which you're writing a white paper almost always already exist in the company. And, in, and there's so much you can get your hands on that you never have to sort of do this from scratch. You can look up competitors' white papers on the same topics. And there's a great website for that, www.bitpipe, B as in boy, I-T, P-I-P-E, dot com, bitpipe dot com. You can find white papers on virtually any topic. So get the competitors' white papers. Previous white papers from the, your company. Tear sheets of ads on the product sales brochures, catalog, product data sheets, case studies can be great to add to white papers, even if the white paper isn't primarily a case study. PowerPoint presentations, technical papers presented at seminars, symposia, et cetera. CD-ROMs, product manual, material on the website, audiovisual scripts, like video scripts or in, in online videos, press kits from the PR department, competitors' ads and sales literature internal memos and letters of technical information, product specifications, engineering drawings, 
business plans, reports, boilerplate from the company's proposals, past issues of their e-newsletter, and of course the company blog. So there's lots of sources for material to write your to write your white paper. There's no shortage of it. When you do it, we talked about the step of on page 21 here of interviewing the subject matter experts. What are some of the questions you would want to ask? Well, if you're writing a white paper to promote a given product, product X, what are product X's features and benefits? What benefit is most important to the, the, pro, the prospect? How is our product different from the competition? If the product isn't different, what attributes or features of our product can be stressed that they don't stress? What technologies does the product compete against? What are the applications? What problems does our product solve in the marketplace? How does the product work and how reliable is it? The questions continue on slide 22. How efficient is the product? How economical? What's the ROI? Who has already bought the product and what do they say about it? Maybe we can use some quotes in our white paper. In what material sizes and models is the product available? How quickly do we deliver the product? What service and support do we offer? Is the product guaranteed its performance or its construction or quality? Who will buy the product? What, what audience is this aimed at? Is this bought by purchasing agents? by process engineers, by plant managers? What is the customer's main concern when buying products in this category? Is it price, delivery, performance, reliability, service, quality, efficiency? Who, who is the buyer? What are they most concerned about? What motivates them? And to how many different buying influences must the copy appeal? OK, so those are the questions to ask the subject matter expert. And now on page 23, let's take a look at what the typic a typical white paper has its outline. First section is the front cover with the title. Number two is the table of contents. Number three is an executive summary. Number four is the section I like to title a look at the problem. And I'll explain that in a minute. Number five is the main body of the white paper. Number six is the conclusion. Number seven is the contact and the call to action. Other white papers may have more or fewer than these, but these are the basics of an average or typical white paper. So on slide 24, we remember we talked about the uh, type of titles, and I said there's a colon title, where uh, the, the first part of the title is before the colon is a, is a sort of a snappier sexier term, and then the subhead under that explains exactly what it's about. So here's a front cover of a white paper, which has a graphic showing a, 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 a product uh, life cycle. And it's explained inside the white paper, but it's eye-catching enough that it makes sense to use it on the cover. And then the title is Chasm Lifecycle Management. Subhead, a single source solution for corporate electronic asset disposal that maximizes revenues and mitigates liability. Basically, this is about a company that if you've got old uh, IT equipment, will, ex will dispose of it in a manner that uh, protects your data, uh, protects you against any uh, pollution liability. In other words, finding your computers in a landfill 10 years from now, and gets rid of them safely and economically. On page 25, Here's an example from another white paper on complying with a government computer regulation called FISMA that, that again, this is a uh, table of contents. So you get this on the, uh, the second page. And if people want to, even though white papers aren't typically huge, this one's 20 pages. And usually there's somewhere between 10 and 20 pages. They could be longer. They could be shorter. Uh, I've seen white papers that are only four or five pages. I don't think there's any magic to the length. If you were asked me to ask me what's the average white paper, I'd say 10 pages. Uh, typically, when a white paper is, is published as a PDF, there are between two and 300 words per page. Uh, that allows for some graphics on the page, subheads, maybe a picture or a diagram, two to 300 words. So if it's uh, 10, 10 pages, that's two to 3,000 words. 
for the total for the white paper. Three thousand word. That means a three thousand word word document would would more than fill it up. And again, here are the sections. There's an executive summary, a look at the problem. Then all those parts underneath are part of the a part of the body. COVID tools, business twin requirements. Then, as we said, a summary and conclusion, and appendices. Part 26 is a typical executive summary, and the executive summary is, is typically a paragraph or two. And I like this one. I think it's very concisely written. All federal agencies are required to comply with the Federal Information Security Management Act, FISMA, guidelines for IT secu system security. By the way, the first time you use an, uh, a term like Federal Information Security Management Act, put the abbreviation FISMA in parentheses. From then on, you could just refer to it as FISMA throughout the document. But the first time you use it, you have to spell it out. Failure to pass a FISMA inspection can result in unfavorable publicity, increased oversight of your agency. This is aimed at uh, government federal agencies, computer breaches, and even a reduction in your IT budget. In this white paper, we'll look at what FISMA is and why it was created, key steps in achieving FISMA compliance, tools that can help you meet FISMA requirements. That's the executive summary. Just very plainly written, quickly gets the entire, uh, gives you an, a, an idea of uh, the, what's going to be in the entire white paper. Then we start off with a section that we call a look at the problem, which, which explains why we're writing this white paper. In other words, what is the problem that the reader might have, or probably has, or otherwise they wouldn't have required, requested this, what is the problem that they have that the information in this white paper would help them solve or deal with? And here we talk about how FISMA requires federal agencies to take certain uh, security precautions and it, it, uh, FISMA will grade these federal agencies and make those grades public on how, they, how well they comply with the FISMA requirements. And if you get a bad compliance score, you could be penalized in many different ways, one of which is just bad publicity for your agency, which makes you look bad. And the other way is an actual a reduction in your IT budget. So that's a look at the problem. Then the main content, you, you'll notice this is from a different white paper. It's from that CHASM white paper on electronic asset disposal. And if you read through, uh, and I'm not going to read it out loud, but if you read through this page, you'll notice that, that this is what I would call typical white paper tone, style, and content. This is, notice that it's pretty much plain English. The content is solid. It's not fluff. It's not dramatically written, but it is clearly written and made to be very easy to read. It's conversational in nature. It's not, doesn't sound like it was a, um, a PhD thesis uh, submitted uh, before a uh, PhD review board. It, it, it's, again, written in plain English. This is the level of language that you should look for when you're writing your own white papers. So note the style, the tone, and the content. On page 29, we see, again, this is for the FISMA white paper, we see the summary and conclusion. And it tells you, uh, again, a, a, sum, a summary of what was in the white paper, sums it up in a few points, and then the conclusions, what you should, based on this information, what are some steps you should take, what should you be doing to fix this problem, which in this case is making sure you comply with the FISMA regulations for federal agency computer security. And they're, they're, they're numbered simply as one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, as numbered points, and, which is not net required, but is probably the best way to write your conclusion. We looked earlier at, at one slide ago on slide uh, 28 as the typical 
uh, what I said was the typical tone and style of the white paper. And on slide 30, here's a little diagnostic tool for making sure your white paper is easy enough to read. And here's what you do. You take a page of your white paper, and first you count the number of words per sentence, and then calculate the average number of words per sentence. So let's say your average number of words per sentence is 20. Then we would cir circle that on the, on the uh, bar. Then you take your page of your white paper, same page, and you can calculate how many syllables there are for every hundred words. And let's say you find that you have uh, 150 syllables per hundred words. You circle that. Now draw a line between the 20 words per sentence and the 150 syllables per word. And we see it goes through um, the 75 on the, on the uh, right column, which is fairly easy. That means your white paper is fairly easy to read. And as long as your white paper gets a, gets a rating on this scale of between very easy and standard, you've written it in a, in a way that is clear enough and is at an acceptable level of readability. However, if you score between, let's say, fairly difficult and very difficult, you want to rewrite it to use uh, fewer words per sentences and shorter words, smaller words, until your score is improved. So that's a, a, a diagnostic tool by, by uh, a guy who was famous in the 50s for doing uh, clear writing seminars, Rudolf Flesch. Here is a, uh, something taken from a human resources white paper on page 31. Uh, the title was Master Learning with Ease. Part one, sense and meaning. And this was a white paper put out by a human resources department on how employees learn. So you can see here the first paragraph. Uh, the words aren't that big, uh, but it, it goes on and on, and it seems convoluted, and it's kind of hard to follow. So on slide 32 is a rewrite of that, the same ideas, the same content in just four sentences. More information has been created in the past five years than in the previous 5,000. The only way to keep up with important new information is to improve your ability to learn. Now you can master learning with ease. How? By making full use of certain mechanisms built into your brain that help the brain acquire knowledge and skills. So it contains all the information that the original does, but in a much clearer, easier to read, user-friendly uh, user -friendly format. Now, most people, uh, the reason that they're writing of their white papers uh, or their other content, when they're writing content, isn't better is that they don't do enough drafts. If you just hand in your first draft, it's not going to be that good. So there's a, there's a conflict. On the one hand, the more time and effort you put in, and as slide 33 shows you with the curve, the more time and effort you put into writing your white paper. In fact, the more time and effort you put into anything, uh, the more you improve, the degree of perfection improves. However, it, it improves rapidly at the beginning, and then as you go along, uh, at a lower at a lower clip. So, therefore, to go from zero to A, that time you get a huge improvement. To go to A to B, you get a significant improvement. But then, uh, to keep going to another draft from B to C, you put in a lot of time and you get just a little improvement. And to go from C to whatever's next, D is even less. So what I tell people is that uh, they always ask me, well, how many drafts of my white paper or my bait piece should I write? I said, whatever you're doing now, one more. Now, once you've written the piece, you have to design it. Uh, uh, you, can, you have two choices here. You can create your own uh, templates for your white papers. And here's, here's uh, one that I use that I created for my white papers. Or you can go online and Google white paper templates and find plenty of templates you can download for free or for a nominal price. So that, that's easy enough to do. And Microsoft uh, has a, uh, a template that they offer that's pretty uh, simple and sensible.
And again, here's more on page 35 of my template. You see that the uh, header is uh, white and black. It's reverse type. The body copy is set in Palantine 12 point. Paragraph line spacing is 1.5 lines. When you're designing your white paper, it's not just text. Don't neglect visuals. Visuals add credibility. And here's the interesting thing. Even if your visual isn't 100% clear to all of the readers, just the very fact that you have it creates credibility. People, when they see graphs, charts, and photos, it makes them believe your text more. It makes them believe that you are proving what you say. And there are different kinds of visuals that you can use in your white paper. A photo or illustration shows what something looks like. A map shows where it is located. An exploded diagram shows how it is put together. The schematic shows how it is works or how it works or how it is organized. A graph shows how much there is, how much one thing varies as a function of another, how much y varies as a function of x. A pie chart shows proportions and percentages. A bar, short, bar chart shows comparisons between quantities. And a table can show a body of related data. So here, as we see on slide 38, we're talking about um, when we grind up old computers for scrap, here's what the, here's what the ground, we say that they can be ground up and separated into their component materials in very fine pieces so they can be recycled. And here are photos that prove you can do this with steel, aluminum, and copper. When you want to show where something is, use a map. That Chasm company that recycles uh, old electronics has locations nationwide. And these are shown uh, by the rectangles over the maps and the states that are grayed in. Page 40, use a diagram. This diagram explains the benefits of the Chasm recycling system. Low cost, no electronic waste, high value of recovery of the uh, materials, and, secu and secured, secured data. As we talked about, bar charts compare different quantities. This bar chart shows when you uh, recover material from a, a scrap computer or IT equipment, shows what percent of it is steel versus polymer versus dust versus aluminum and, and copper. And that's shown again by a bar chart. That's page 41. T tables. This was a white paper that we looked at before uh, the death of white papers where it talked about various forms of uh, user identification. Pat and it's not just passwords. It's you, can have a, you can have a password or a PIN number, a personal identification number, a token that you carry, or a smart card, or a voice ID, or a fingerprint ID, or a retinal scan. So it, this, this explain this table, the various types of authentic, authentication factors. Uh, Something you know is like a password. Something you have is a smart card. And something you are is your fingerprint. So what formats can we have for our free content offers, for our bait pieces? One is we can have uh, what we call guide, which, were, which are informative uh, instructions on how to accomplish a certain task. And here is a, this was published by Bulova Watches years ago, a simple guide to running a profit building business gift program. And of course, their purpose in publishing this guide was to convince people to give Bulova Watches as the business gift. You can have a standard white paper. And here's the one we looked at earlier, the death of passwords. And then even though there's not a colon after passwords, this is a colon style title, because we have the depth of passwords, very dramatic, and then the subhead, three easy steps to increasing user productivity, enhancing authentication, and lowering password reset costs with enterprise single sign-on. So we know exactly what it is. 
if you publish ebooks, whether for free or to sell them, these make good bait pieces. People like ebooks. So here's one that I publish that I also give away to potential clients called The World's Best Kept Copywriting Secrets. A reporter log uh, is a brochure, the combination of a brochure with a white paper. It's a product brochure, and this is a product brochure, what every attorney needs to know about obtaining crucial intelligence quickly, easily, affordably. It's about an intelligence service, not really a product, it's a service uh, of intelligence gathering for law firms. But within the, the it has the sound of being a how-to guide, and the, the, the brochure itself mixes information about the service itself versus tips, how-to tips about how to do your own uh, due diligence research. So we call that a report log because it combines a brochure and a report. Special reports, you can call, uh, we mentioned, uh, you know, if you're aiming at a consumer audience, they love to get a special report. And here's one that I published called How to Double Your Response Rates at Half the Cost. Now you'll notice a, a little technique that I use. I have a price in the upper right corner of the brochure of $29. I put that there because it adds perceived value. Now how do I justify that? Well, if you look at the next slide, 48, this is a page from a shop, uh, 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 this is a page from my website, which is hooked up to a shopping cart, where we actually sell the report for $29. So people have actually paid $29 for the report, which means it's not a lie for me to say that it has a value of $29. So anytime you produce uh, white papers, reports, manuals, and you put a price on them, put them up on a page like this, as shown on slide 48 on your website, and you don't have to actively promote it, but people, just some of your traffic, will be ordering them from time to time, and you're doing this not to make money from selling them, but so you can legitimately claim that they have the value that you say they do. Other formats, page 49, a booklet. If you do a, you can do a booklet that's just a PDF, and it's shaped like a booklet, which is four by nine inches, or you can do a physical booklet. 10 sales boosting strategies for security dealers and integrators. You can do a rack brochure, which is a brochure that goes in a rack, typically, not in Iraq, the country, but it goes in a rack, which is typically done in travel agencies and banks. Again, a four by nine inch brochure. And this one is about a bank service, but it has a, it has a, a content oriented headline, a guide to preventing fraud and identity theft. It sounds like you will get useful information just for reading this brochure. Catalogs, more and more uh, manufacturers are turning out catalogs and positioning them as content. Where here they have a, uh, the, the coupon of this ad says, yes, please send me your free shade ideas catalog. Again, positioning the catalog as its own valuable content. How do you generate leads for your bait pieces? Well, one way is to send a sales letter, is to use physical direct mail. And this was a letter for that uh, company, Chasm, that had that uh, electronic uh, dis equipment disposal service. And they offered a free white paper, which you can see in the PS of their letter, for a free copy of our white paper, maximizing revenues and mitigating liabilities uh, for electronic asset disposition. They just put the main benefits from the title of the white paper into the title uh, of the, uh, you know, of the description. And it was offered successfully via a mailing. Here is the mailing on slide 54. And you'll notice on the reply card, again, what is stressed is not so much the service but the, actually the white paper. Send me your free white paper with the title underneath, and then repeat, send me your free white paper, and then under that is call me to discuss your electronic asset disposal needs. So the white paper is emphasized, and there's even a picture of the white paper, not a picture of the service, but a picture of the white paper with a yours free burst next to it to maximize uh, response rates. You can do the same thing with email. Here's an HTML email offering a free uh, white paper 
says, click here to download your free copy of Perfect Pitch, How to Get Heard in a 24-7 News Cycle. And this is for a firm that distributes press releases. On slide 56, you can see you can actually use a press release sent out to the media to get distribution of your date piece. This is from Unique Truck, which has a, uh, a, tr a truck, a tool catalog for truck maintenance managers, a catalog of tools used in the, in the repair and maintenance of trucks. And it says, new, free, expanded, 40-page truck safety and maintenance products buyer's guide available from Unique Truck Equipment. And the press release says, Unique Truck Equipment, a supplier of specialty truck products, the fleet managers, has just released a new edition of its quarterly publication, the Unique Truck Safety and Maintenance Product Buyer's Guide. So the press release can generate inquiries for your base piece. Don't forget on page 57, slide 57, banner ads can work very effectively in generating re requests for a bait piece. Instead of, or, or, instead of advertising a product, you can advertise a free brochure, a free catalog, a free white paper, a free special report. H and how does that work? Well, if we use postcards and emails and pay-per-click and search engines and all the ways to drive traffic uh, to get people to request our free content, then we capture the lead and we can send a, a series of Follow-up contacts, which if done online are best done by email, but it could be also phone calls, where we try to uh, convert them from someone who has just requested the free information to a, a serious prospect, to a sale, to an order. Click-through rates, what can we expect? Slide 59. For a free offer, offering free content, an email sent to your house list, will generate a click-through rate of between 6 and 10%. Sent to a third-party list, it'll be, as you can see by the last bullet on this slide, 0 to 2%, usually 1 to 2%. And again, as you see from the third bullet from the bottom, if the free offer is sent to your house list, your, your, your subscribers, your new easing subscribers, 6 to 10% click-through rate when offering something free. Page 60, just to repeat, uh, if you've got a landing page and you're, you're hitting a general uh, retail target, you can get 1% to 3% uh, conversion rate on that landing page. In other words, for everyone who lands on that landing page offering your free white paper, uh, between 1% to 3% will request it. But uh, if it's a targeted niche you know, and you're going to IT professionals talking about Unix data centers, it can be much higher. Hey, Bob, I'm just going to interject real quickly in here for folks, a question that's coming up. Uh, we do have folks, a previous webinar that Bob did, very informative on, very focused on um, the whole methodology around generating leads and so forth, and the lead generation aspects, as well as one on optimizing landing pages. So just a note on that, where that whole process, the previous slide, is covered in great detail. You can check that out at blog.pinpoints.com. So if you look at slide 61, we talked about this earlier. Uh, if, you, if you stress your offer like that chasm thing where it stressed the white paper and said yours free, when, you're prim when your copy is primarily offer driven, which would let's say is 10% branding and 90% offer, the first, uh, the first uh, row here, your cost per lead can be anywhere from $50 to $100. Now when you go in the opposite direction, when your offer is primarily, when your marketing is primarily brand driven, where it talks 90% about your brand message, and only 10% about the offer content, then it goes up to $800 to $1,000. Basically, if you, if you look at the ratios there, when you stress your offer, you, your cost per lead is typically one-tenth of what it is if you just talk about the brand. Or to put that in a reverse fashion, uh, stressing the offer uh, it gets 10% better results than stressing the brand when you're looking for a response. And page 62, here's an old, old ad from the 70s or 60s. Nothing interesting about it except it says uh, it's a med tampon and the big headline is your first package free. Again, stressing the offer. If you want response, you stress the offer. 
So to sum up on slide 63, this shows the customer acquisition process. We find a universe of potential clients with the money, authority, and desire to buy what we're selling. We send them a lead generation promo. They respond to it, and we, we fulfill their inquiry, including the bait piece they, they requested. And then if we can define their need or project, we can quote a price for it. And then if they accept, we've made a sale, or we can negotiate it first and then make a sale. We follow up and close the sale. So again, the content bait piece, the content marketing comes at the beginning when you do your lead generating promotion, you offer free content. And what's the, re what's the response rate? Well, on page 64, we see a formula that says response equals a function of offer. The higher the perceived value of your bait piece, the more, the, the more unusual it is, how unique it is, the relevancy to the reader's problems and their desire to have it, the higher your response rate will be. And as a rule of thumb, on page 65, we have LGM plus BPO equals two times RR. That says lead, whatever the lead generation method is you're using, if you add a BPO, a bait piece offer, you will get two times your normal response rate. You'll typically offering free content or a white paper will double the response rates if you do it right without diminishing the quality of the lead. And I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, you've been a great group. And Craig, on slide 66, uh, let me turn it over to you.